Hello and welcome to this wonderful event. Thank you so much for joining us. We are here and very proud to launch this beautiful book. Uh, nothing, ah, rather, there is nothing so whole as a broken heart, mending the world as Jewish anarchist. And this gorgeous book was just published at the end of last month this year by AK Press. And tonight we are thrilled to present a discussion between the book's editor, Cindy Milstein, and several of the contributors who will all introduce themselves um, in a little bit. There's just a couple of things that I would like to mention first. So first of all, if you need closed captioning service, it's available to anyone who wants it. All you need to do to enable it is just click the CC button you see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And thanks so much to Kai who is willing to type up the captions for us all evening. Uh, my name is Tamara Filiovich, and I am the Membership Engagement Coordinator with Independent Jewish Voices Canada. For those of you unfamiliar with our organization, we are national Jewish organizations with several chapters across Canada. And so we're grounded in Jewish tradition that opposes all forms of racism and advocates for equal human rights and justice for all in Israel-Palestine. And about 10 years ago, we became the first national Jewish organization in Canada to officially support the boycott, divestment and sanctions campaign against Israel. And this is a point that we're very, very proud of. And we've been working with BDS campaigns with our partners in Palestine and around the world ever since. And we encourage everyone to check out our website at www igvcanada, in one word, dot org, and to follow us on social media. And if you want to sign up for a newsletter and hear more about events like today and our other work, I also encourage you to go to our site uh, and go to the newsletter tab. So we will be sharing both of the links um, in the chat. And also, very important, if you would like us to continue being able to put forward these types of events and do other work, uh, we encourage you to make a donation, which you can also do on our website, igvcanada.org slash donate. And for today, I'll be turning it over to Cindy very soon, who will present the book and kick off the discussion amongst the contributor. Uh, there won't be a formal uh, question and answer period during the event, but we do encourage you to use the chat to interact and we will do our best to answer the questions in the chat. Also, if there are terms and concepts that come up that you might not be familiar with, uh, we're very happy to have our friend Noah uh, to help clarify them in the chat as well. And so that also goes without saying that in the true spirit of anarchist debate, uh, we will keep the chat respectful, supportive, and engaging. And so last thing, but not least, before I turn it over to Cindy, I want to encourage you all to buy this amazing book if you haven't already. And you know, for folks in Canada, you can order it from a Canadian distributor at leftwingbooks.net, so leftwingbooks, all in one word, .net. And if you're in the US, you can get it from AK Press at akpress.org. And so as always, uh, we encourage you to ask it at your local bookshop, independent bookstore, or get your library to order it and make it free for all. And so this being said, it is my absolutely great pleasure to turn it over to Cindy Milstein, who is the author and the editor of There is Nothing So Whole as a Broken Heart. Take it away, Cindy. Hi. Hi. Uh, I want to um, start off by uh, really thanking um, IJV Canada, um, especially Tamara and Erin, a longtime friend, um, for, for so much work into this, and um, Kay for doing captioning, and my dear friend Noah for doing the chat. And uh, all the contributors that are here who are also friends and all of you who are present here. Um, I really, I'm really appreciative of everybody joining us tonight. And um, I include our ancestors too, because I think they're here with us. So everyone who's surrounding us right now is really beautiful. Um, and I wanna kind of bring us into this space um, 
which I understand as a do-it-ourselves queered Jewish anarchist space um, in a kind of a way that we do spaces um, as, as Jewish, as Jews and as anarchists. Um, <laughs> um, well, especially as Jewish anarchists um, for thousands, thousands and thousands of years um, as both diasporic and dispossessed peoples, um, peoples who are often um, despised all around the globe, um, but people who are rebels and were resilient and who knew that our task is to mend the world um, as people who were able to make community outside and against and not included in states and empires, which I feel really proud of for thousands of years. Um, we're really pretty good at making our own spaces that are collective, um, portable, temporary, um, you know, flexible, beautiful, magical, and sacred spaces. I mean, that's something, you know, both anarchists and Jews are good at, but Jews have been doing it for a long, long time. So I want to bring us into this space together kind of usher us all in as if we're at a you know one of the many Jewish gatherings together or maybe a weekly Shabbat um I'm really touched tonight Ev almost everyone in this call or I think everyone pretty much was um gathered unfortunately in the pre-pandemic um times when we could gather was gathered at for like for instance we did this lovely um Jewish anarchist Shabbat by this magical canal in in Montreal at the on the Friday before the the Montreal anarchist book fair started and it was the 20th year and yeah, I think there are people from all across Turtle Island, most of whom didn't know each other and watching over the night, just how ritual and space and conversation started bringing people together. But then I have to credit Ami had come there from, it's gonna speak later, Pittsburgh with I think 10, 10 um, other queer rebels, anarchists, <laughs> Jews, and started sitting around singing songs. And then, you know, several hours later after we were just gathering songs and just filling the air with songs in the space we'd made. There's this way in which this really beautiful space had opened up into a time outside of capitalism and white Christmas. We might have lost Cindy. Hopefully we'll get Cindy back or that at least point past them. Um, you and cut out for so, a bit, Cindy, just so you oh, know. I'm, I'm sorry. You were saying white Christian, and then what ah, comes okay. next? <laughs> so, so I'll just, uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks. No, I just I was just trying to emphasize that, you know, I think one thing that this anthology does points out and that, and that all of us here do is that we're, we have like a profound amount of experience and playbooks and rituals to create community outside of states, to create a gathering. So let's create a gathering tonight together. And one of the ways we do that, and this is reflected in the anthology, is through the many holidays um, and rituals that are that are um, really a part of Judaism again for thousands of years. And that I wanna point out many of which begin at this moment of twilight and are wrapped up at twilight. This beautiful non-binary liminal in-between space that is neither you know, in the time that we hate nor yet in the time that we want. So I really gonna bring us together in this beautiful twilight gathering tonight and invite us into a space with, to begin with a little bit of a, a note that tonight is actually a holiday. There are almost holidays almost constantly within Judaism, which is beautiful. We wanna get outside of capitalism and white Christmas supremacy and all sorts of other awful time spaces. Um, tonight is the 33 day of the Omar count. And I think, uh, Malka will do an Omar count at the very end of this event. But um, this, this 33rd day is called Lag Ba Omer. And uh, the date coincides with two events that happened in the second century. One of which was a plague stopped, um, ended um, among some students of a rabbi. And another is that this is the anniversary of the death of another rabbi who wrote the Zohar, which is this mystical Kabbalistic text within Judaism. So what Lagba Omar is, you can read many, many interpretations about it, but it's a celebration of mystical magicalness within Judaism, a mutual aid, um, some say of rainbows and unicorns, <laughs> depending on the interpretations. And most of all, it's celebrated with bonfires, with the fire of resistance and the fire of connection and the fire of, of keeping us together. So I wanna bring in, like as if we're sitting around a bonfire having a conversation and move into another part of what the Omar is about, which is this time of, of a period of mourning too and remembering those who've come before us remembering our losses and our pains and tonight i want to move into something that we do um, ami is going to do a song um there's something called kaddish which is a mourner's prayer and there are many versions of it so tonight we're going to use the song 
And it creates a space where we can remember. And I want to emphasize that remembrance is for many things in terms of honoring and, and understanding our history and etc. But memory, as many of us say, you know, may, may memory spark blessed revolutions. It helps us resist too, right? So I'm going to hang on to that. So during when Ami is singing, I'll let Ami introduce us. I encourage you to like write or speak or think or be present with you know, all the losses, um, whether they're your own or at the hands of state and racist and anti-Semitic violence. Um, yeah, all the things that we, we have to, to grieve over the centuries and up to the present. So Ami. Hey everybody, I'm Ami. Um, so what um, we're gonna do for Kaddish, as Cindy was saying, Kaddish is this moment of opening space to remember and honor those who have died and to help elevate their souls. Um, and there's a song that I learned a few years ago when I was studying at the Yiddish Book Center that is a song called In Dresden is Fenster. And it's a song um, that tells about a man who's sitting at the window and looking at, down at the street and saying, where is my love? Where are the people who I was expecting to see here? Where are they? Where are they? Where are they? And for me, it just hits this, it's not Kaddish in the traditional sense, but it hits the same tone of that longing, that expecting, that wanting to see someone. Um, so um, a little kavana and intention for this song I'm going to sing is to let ourselves be the one who's longing, the one who's missing, the one who's calling out, and to also let ourselves be the one who's being called to. So who is calling us in, who's missing us, um, what communities are we part of? So um, Kay is gonna put the lyrics in the chat in <clears throat> the Yiddish I'll be singing in and the English translation. And at the end, I'm also going to put the YouTube link so people can listen to the song on their own. And if you know the song, feel free to sing along in your own home. Okay. I'm gonna be singing based on the, it's a recording from Ruth Rubin from a man in Grodno, Lithuania. In Dreisen is Finster, in Dreisen is Finster, she spät bei Men herz kein Jum, kein Schorch, kein Fegele fliehen auf der Men hört kein Jum, kein Schorch, kein Fege, fliehen auf der Gau. Wo bist du gewähn? Ich will mit dir zwei Wörter reden. Wo bist du gewähn? Ich will mit dir zusammen gehen. To kuma rois zu mir, mein Teil ist Leben. Ich steh und wart in Gas, ich weiß allein nicht verwurst. Ich steh und wart in Gas, ich weiß allein nicht verwurst. Komm, Jeharois, will mit dir zwei Wörter reden. Komm, Jeharois, will mit dir zusammen sein. Oi, dein Schein Punin, mit deine schwarzen Kirchkehle. Oi, und dein Mäuel mit deine Schäne weiß in Gezähn. 
Oi um dein moil me deine schöne weisinke zehn A wo bist du gewen Will me dir zer werter reden Komm she Will me dir zu zamen as Thank you. Thanks, Ami, for doing that. Yeah, there's such a sort of bittersweet poignancy to that music, the sound, the sound of it, even if we don't understand the words. And yeah, I'm gonna speak for just a few minutes about sort of the anthology and um, the title, There's Nothing So Whole as a Broken Heart comes from a phrase that a rabbi wrote many centuries ago, trying to understand what it means. And I think many of us who, whether we're Jewish or not, but those of us who are anarchists and radicals and queers of all types who've had to, to struggle to understand, you know, how to, how to make our own homes in this world when this world does not make homes for us. Um, the poignancy of like having our hearts broken and so much stolen from us so many times, and yet, maintaining our hearts and maintaining our wholeness through that and what a, a beautiful challenge that is um and so this anthology arose out of that challenge out of my own broken heart and my own sense of never being at home in this world and um i understand myself as maybe more than anything almost in a, in a sense like a diasporic anarchist um that I'm not at home in this world and I'm always seeking to find spaces and create spaces with others collectively that allow us to feel that sense of what a, a different kind of world could look like together, different kinds of homes that are of our, our own self-organizing and inhabiting. And in, in traveling around, I traveling around in sort of the diasporic journeys that I'm on, which is again, both sort of from diaspora, diaspora means to scatter, and it can mean to scatter like seeds or ourselves or, you know, or, our stories. And there's something, you know, of course, awful about that because most diasporas are forced upon us, right? And, and then there's also the generativeness of which we take our, our broken hearts with us. And in that, in that homelessness, in that diaspora, we find new connections, we throw out new seeds, we, we figure out ways to, you know, create something out of nothing together again. Um, and so this book came out of me kind of in, in different community, communities all sort of across Turtle Island and beyond of being places and, and suddenly realizing there were more and more Jewish anarchists creating their own spaces, learning language again that had been stolen from us, all sorts of different language. It's not just, it's not just Yiddish, though it is Yiddish. Um, also many, many different languages, many rituals, traditions, um, many, you know, ways of resisting and in this world and maintaining ourselves as resilient and and many like like we are, we're doing now the Kaddish or Shabbats and and I just realized I keep go, going to more and more of these that there was something going on in the, some sort of resurgence within Jewish anarchism and it was um every time I stepped into one of those spaces I I felt I felt like I was mending a bit like I was becoming more whole right so I I was like both trying to come to my own self understanding of what that meant and, and how powerful that felt and understanding that I wasn't alone in this, that this is some kind of moment that was happening. So this anthology came out of me sort of just asking people to write about how this moment felt to them. And I didn't even know what was gonna come out of that at first. And I think to me, that's the power of sort of this book, I think is precisely like a Jewish, a, 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 a Jewish practice, <laughs> it's us, repeatedly telling each other our stories. We just passed a period called um, Passover or Pesach, or it's in many different languages. We could name it many different things, but it's this time of, for, you know, about eight days when people mostly gather with, again, communal meals and communal, very intricate rituals, but to spend time for that week retelling stories of liberation and retelling what it means to be liberated, but still not be in freedom and how we journey toward that and what that means and the joys and the sorrows. and. I was, I'm really struck by like 
this tradition, this beautiful gift within Judaism that like almost requires us to tell, there's, there is nothing within Judaism except stories. There's Torah, there's, Tal there's books, but all the books are collections of stories and collections of, of we could call them do it ourselves laws or guidelines or you know, compasses to help us try to understand how to be good people and, and do good in this world, right? And how to stay together as a community without, without hierarchical structures. In, in very like egalitarian, collective, self-directed ways, right? In which we grow and develop as human beings. And, um, and so this book is, what, what, what this book became was only as much as us telling stories to each other. And it's not meant as, it's meant as like a, a snapshot in time. And I didn't even understand really until it came into print what it was, what it was illuminating. And, so it's been really beautiful to hear other people reflect back, which is what we're gonna do in a few minutes, is there's, there's five um, people who also wrote pieces for this anthology on this, on this um, gathering in this, in this space of, of hanging out together tonight. Um, and yeah, have them share their thoughts on, on what it means, what, what they wrote about, what it means, what kind of space this anthology's opened up. But you know, for me, books are just containers, they're portals again to other worlds. And so I want these stories to be the beginning of stories where you sit down and you read them with other people and then you tell your own stories and what it means to be a queer Jew right now or trans Jew right now or trans anarchist, right? What it means to not be Jewish, but to, to feel like you resonate with some of the pieces in the book. What it means to tell our stories of dispossession and being diasporic and having the world stolen from us by again, white Christian supremacy or colonialism or capitalism, all the things that bind us together, right? And within Judaism, there's a tradition, which is you don't just tell stories, but you interpret them and you wrestle with them and you debate them and you watch them grow and that they be, freedom becomes more by sharing stories and expanding on what it means to be free. That it isn't a done, it's never, Judaism, even, even the religion separate from an anarchist view of it is, is this, beautiful gift of, of us all understanding ourselves to be able to educate ourselves together toward better understandings of mending the world and better understandings of freedom and what it means to be a human and live and, and, and die and be part of, right? So it's a really beautiful gift. So I hope you'll take the stories and do that with, with them. Um, but what I've understood since it's come out, and I'll just touch on this and then we'll turn to everybody else, is I realized sort of in hindsight of the book coming out and, and myself reflecting on it, that it's opening up this really profound space to say, we're for those of us, I feel like I've been doing this for a while, but I think for, for a lot of Jewish anarchists, there's, there's this real throwing off of assimilation that was forced on us in a sense by a survival strategy by a lot of our, our parents or grandparents who had lived through in a just a generation ago, um, massive amounts of trauma and near genocide and loss of everything, their whole entire communities. And their survival strategy, some of them in the space called Turtle Island was to try to assimilate, to hide from that trauma, right? And I think for a lot of us, we're like, but we, we don't want to, we don't want them to win. <laughs> we, um, there's a beautiful phrase that has emerged with this research in anarchism is um, uh, we will outlive them. And it was by a group of Jews who were about to be murdered and they were being forced by fascists to sing a song while they were, before they were about to be murdered. And the song was supposed to be like sort of something like, you know, we're all great. It was just, you know, some happy song from their community. And they changed the lyrics to be like, we will outlive them. And it's a song that gets sung now at lots of demonstrations and it's on banners and, you know, patches. And people are reclaiming that to say, no, we're going to be out and who we are, we're not going to hide. That assimilation for thousands of years has never worked. The fact that people have tried it again for the last generation or so is a false, is false, you know, and the more we don't assimilate, the more we can reclaim the beauty of who we are, not just the sorrow of who we are, right? All the beautiful traditions and cultures. And I really wanna compare this to other moments where you know, there's been moments of queer liberation or um, black anarchism or indigenous anarchism or moments when people are like, I don't wanna to have to give up who I am, am and I wanna be liberated. And the two together are so much more powerful. They're more than the sum of the two parts, right? And so that's what I think one thing this anthology is doing is opening up space for this beautiful sort of Jewish anarchist liberatory moment and that we have a lot to bring to this world, not just for ourselves, which a lot of us, this is a very healing, powerful moment where we can reclaim healing traditions and queer traditions and ecological traditions, which I hope we can touch on. There's so much and you start going into it. It's like this incredible, I feel like I've just been handed this thing that just gets 
every day grows in immense beauty and the, the richness of what that brings me back to an ecological anarchism or a queer anarchism or a feminist anarchism through my Jewish anarchism, Jewish anarchism. Um, but likewise, it, it further connects us to other peoples who are bringing their selves to their anarchism and saying, I want to bring my rituals to spaces, right? Um, Aaron and I, who's on this, on this, uh, on this event in, in this space with us tonight, and I were chatting the other day about the beauty of um, the indigenous struggles, where especially in so-called Canada, which have been at the forefront, I think, of you know real powerful direct actions, but also building, you know, using those direct actions to build homes and healing centers, to not give up land that was never, you know, they never to not let the state take land that they never gave away in the first place. And that so much of that has been song and ritual that come out of different indigenous people's traditions, right? And that more and more us as Jewish anarchists have been able to engage in those spaces and bring our own healing practices and our own rituals and our own traditions, not necessarily at those specific moments, right? But in solidarity, right? We were talking the other day about a moment where a couple of years ago in, uh, again, near in and outside of Montreal, um, different Jews brought and Jewish anarchists brought music to um, struggles against detention centers and borders and brought that as a form of organizing, right? And direct action and, and trying to shut down. So, so it's a powerful moment, I think, of us understanding our solidarity, not just as Jews, but as everyone struggling for freedom and liberation. And the last things I wanna to touch on really is I think what's really different about this, there's been other books about Jewish anarchism. Jewish anarchism is such a long tradition. As long as there've been anarchists, there've been Jewish anarchists. and Jewish anarchistic people have been around for thousands of years before anarchism. And you know, probably the most famous anarchist that most people know would be Emma Goldman, who, and many Jews were, are radicals and it isn't an accident. We could talk about that later too. There's something about Jewish history, Jewish trauma, Jewish experience, or struggles, you know, or struggles against, uh, you know, all forms of, a bunch of forms of oppression, but also within the, the tradition, the spiritual tradition, there's something in that that is not accidental, right? So Emma Goldman, who is one of the, the most probably well-known anarchists, if people know one anarchist, that's, um, they know Emma Goldman, who is Jewish, really had a fraught relationship with her Judaism, didn't front it very often, probably knew Yiddish, didn't use it that often, or didn't like to use it, even though she knew many languages. And so now I think we come to the present, this resurgent Jewish anarchism. And there's this also this interesting new sort of claim to say we can be spiritual without supremacist hierarchical organized religion without you know giant buildings that tell us they're going to control how we understand our spirituality that we can have do-it-ourselves forms of spirituality so we, and that's a really distinct moment and that we can understand our judaism as part of our anarchism i think that's really distinctive and and really enriching our anarchism and that it's a queer trans jewish anarchism that's really distinctive to this moment and feminist i think there's this really profound move toward that right now, which again, I hope we can discuss. Um, and I maybe say the last thing is, I think maybe it's no accident that this has emerged right now at this time period for a host of reasons, historically, including, you know, the emergent, the, the rise of people just rediscovering their own sort of, you know, identities in non-essentialistic ways and trying to decolonize ourselves in, in all sorts of different ways and trying to understand all our relationships to land. And it's particularly difficult for people who are diasporic and then get forced onto other people's land who didn't want them there necessarily. What does that look like? All these things have raised a Jewish anarchism as has the rise of a fascism globally. And I, I don't wanna minimize that. And for a lot of us, our anti-fascism has brought us closer to our Judaism and our Judaism has brought us closer to our anti-fascism. And the fact that anti-Semitism has is a daily occurrence and has harmed many of us and hurt many of us and people are dying because of it is that is another reason not just because it impacts us personally as Jews and as anarchists but because we see the connections with that rise of fascism of who the fascists are killing they go after you know synagogues black churches mosques right um you know they go after you know people who are asian asian pacific they go after trans they go after right you know people who aren't documented, I can go on and on and on about all the people that are cops and fascists are targeting right now, but we have more in common together 
And I think that's, in a sense, making us as who are Jewish anarchists understand ourselves to be like, we have a lot to offer. We've been fighting fascism for a long, long time. Our calendar is five, seven, eight, one now. That's a lot of years of fighting fascistic forces. And that maybe we can bring our wisdom to bear on this, along with all of peoples who aren't Jewish and have a much stronger sort of anti-fascist and anarchism. So, okay, so I want to I want to move into, we're going to move into this time where we're going to have like have a conversation among us. Hopefully it's gonna be hopefully a little informal and it's okay. You may see some of us interrupt each other and that's okay because we like to have conversations where it's lively and we're wrestling with ideas to try to understand like, why is it so powerful to, to bring Jewishness and Judaism and anarchism and queerness all together and why those make for something more that we couldn't get. I'll just end on this. I keep saying this. I often say try anarchism for life and I've realized really poignantly that the only thing that's gonna keep me an anarchist for life, the only thing that has is when I've lost faith is my Judaism because it has the structure I need to get me through the whole of life and anarchism doesn't, right? So it's important for us to understand that there's things we need that anarchism can't offer all of us. And anarchism, if you don't have that with Judaism, you can have some pretty ugly Judaism as we understand, right? <laughs> the state, state of Israel, most, I would say anarchists don't particularly like that state any more than they like any states, right? So Judaism alone isn't enough, anarchism alone isn't enough. Neither is queer, being queer. So how do we, how do we bring those together? Um, so I wanna move into first letting each person who's a contributor and I really, really wanna grateful for letting them edit, letting being brave enough and vulnerable enough to write for this in ways that are really from the heart, letting me edit them a bunch of times and um, being visible as a Jewish anarchist. So I'm gonna start off with Aaron and they're each gonna introduce themselves for a couple minutes and then we're gonna have a discussion. Thanks, Cindy. Um... I'm wow, I'm still feeling really emotionally tender from the opening of this. And thank you so much, Ami. That was beautiful. I think it's rare that we get to have these spaces um, that that feel nourishing and and healing and and enriching. And um, it's it's special. So um yeah, I, I'm often the one moderating these events for IJV, so people might know me. I, I work for IJV. I'm the communications and media lead. Um, and, and the work I do for IJV feels really natural to me because I, I came into a lot of my radical politics through my Jewish identity, but also um, th through Israel, Palestine and, and my trips there and um, seeing an apartheid state up close, um, learning uh, from Palestinians and their incredible traditions of, of resistance and direct actions and, and Israeli anarchists who, you know, daily were defying the privilege they had to, to put their bodies on the line and to stand with Palestinians. And, um, you know, so, so I first went to Israel, Palestine in my early twenties and then came back to Montreal, just um, completely inspired by that. And, and, and so it's translated a lot of way in, into my own politics. And I try to bring that spirit of resistance um, to all, all the work I do in anarchist organizing and, and in IJV. And um, to just say a little word about my, my piece in this anthology, I'm, I'm really, really honored to be part of this amongst so many other amazing uh, Jewish anarchist comrades. Uh, I wrote a klezmer playlist for a revolt against fascism. So I like to write about music. I you know, kind of my, my other hat that I wear in life is um, I'm a music journalist, like a amateur music journalist, I guess you could say. Uh, I, I host a podcast called The Rebel Beat, which is a, a podcast of revolutionary music. And a few years ago, I, I started to notice that there was this incredible resurgence of anti-fascist and very radical and, and very anarchistic Klezmer coming out. Uh, I have to give a shout out to Avi because I wouldn't even know of a lot of this music if it wasn't for Avi, who in a lot of ways is like my DJ musical muse and is constantly passing me records and saying, you got to listen to this band or you have to listen to that band. 
Um, and people might have heard if you were on at the beginning of this event, we were playing some music from Jeff Berner. Uh, and that that song he was playing, Daloy Polizze, that, that's part of the playlist that I was writing about. Because that song is a perfect example of what a lot of radical Jewish musicians are doing these days where they're taking older songs. So, so that song, Daloy Polizze, is a Russian Jewish anarchist song uh, written, I believe, around like 1905. Don't quote me on that. Um, but, you know, in Tsarist Russia, and it, it was a song responding to police violence against striking Jewish workers. And, and what Jeff Berner did is he, he took that, you know, century old song and remixed it for modern times uh, to make a statement that the police have never gotten any less awful. And, you know, out of your houses, into the streets, everybody's saying, fuck the police, Daloy Polizze. And so my piece is just a little assemblage of different songs like that, that again, are, are borrowing from these Jewish anarchist traditions that we have, but really reflecting very much on, on the modern moment. Um, you know, I wrote it like at the height of the Trump presidency and, and watching events like Charlottesville, but also you know, the Quebec City mosque shooting and watching fascists getting organized um, in Quebec. And, um, and so, so I hope that through that essay, we can, you know, just love and appreciate and celebrate this, this beautiful um, kind of ensemble of, of anarchist klezmer that exists these days and use it as an inspiration for revolt against fascism. Um, so that that's my piece, and I will will do this alphabetically. So I will turn it over to Ami next. <clears throat> Hi everybody, I'm Ami. I use he and they pronouns. Um, thanks for letting me sing. That was a real treat for me. I love that song. Um, and thank you to everyone um, panelists who are here, who I know in many different capacities, um, but with so much love and. Just so everybody who's watching at home knows there's 141 participants here. And for me, that is just incredible that there's 141 people who are, and maybe even more who are interested in this subject. So thank you. Um, I live in so-called Pittsburgh and I'm a first year rabbinical stu school student with um, Aleph, um, the Renewal Rabbinical School. And I um, am a Hebrew school teacher <laughs> and a Jewish educator, and I organize um, a community center called Ratzon Center for Healing and Resistance. That is a community center for queers, Jews, um, anarchists, and anyone of marginalized identities. Um, and my piece in the book is um, about my experience. Uh, I'm so sorry a, to interrupt, Ami. I just missed the name of the community center where you- Yeah, totally. it's called um, Ratzon. Yeah, Center for Healing and Resistance. And um, my, yeah, my piece is about my experience being um, working as a Hebrew school teacher at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh um, when the shooting there happened. And my experience with like leaning on Jewish tradition to hold, um, me and my students and my community as we move through the time and just being um, awestruck by how much of the Jewish tradition helped us organize and how it went beyond what we could have even done for ourselves as um, without it. And um, yeah, an honor to my, and it's a lot about honoring my ancestors and their struggles. So yeah, thank you for having me and pass it to Avi. Hi everyone, um, I'm Avi. I use he him pronouns. I'm here in Montreal or Jojage. Um, and uh, really glad to be here um, and happy about this book coming out. I just wanna like very quickly because it's such a like new thing uh, say a quick bracha, uh, posting the transliteration. Baruch atah Adonai elheinu melech olam asher kishan shehechianu v'kimanu v'higianu l'azman hazeh 
Blessed are you, source of all life, who has uh, kept us alive, sustained us, and brought us to this moment um, of this book release and this talk. And um, so, uh, um, yeah, I have a piece in the book that I co-wrote with Malka, who's here, and Shoni, who's not here, um, about our um, radio show that we did um, sort of on and off from 2008 to 2015. Uh, it was called Radio 613, and the piece in the book is called Autonomous Jewish Culture on the Airwaves. And uh, it's reflecting on the process of, um, uh, yeah, starting the show, doing the show, and um, yeah, and sort of the Jewish anarchists, sort of what, what it might have been like for the three of us coming into why we created a Jewish anarchist radio show in like the mid early 2000s. Um, and yeah, I, I just want to say uh, also like um, in addition, like that just thanks and appreciation for like the Jewish anarchists who came um, before um, us here and including like just like in my lifetime and or just before my lifetime like um you know especially people who um when it like I don't know uh um Sh Shoni mentioned this book is a bit of a coming out party for those of us who are like especially religious or you know culturally inspired Jewish anarchists and like just just appreciating that, you know, there's like times before where people had that as a very coherent political and religious and ethical practice before, but it was like pushed down, pushed away, often by other Jews. <laughs> um, but, uh, and, you know, and that, and that their efforts, you know, helped, you know, create whatever space has helped create this moment. And hopefully this moment and this weaving of stories that Cindy has done, will create more weaving and this weaving tapestry is not finished. A lot of what is talked about in the book is from people like myself of Ashkenaz Eastern European descent. And uh, you know, there's a lot of anti-authoritarian and, and, and anarchist Jews uh, who, who, you know, who I think will, will be, you know, hopefully like that that weaving will continue to happen as well um you know because uh because we are such a like mixed multitude and um that's gonna be beautiful and uh that's it i will post either madeline and i will post our show we just uh put it uh on spotify this year even though we started in 2008 online posting it but we just sort of figured out the algorithm so it's on spotify and stitcher but also a website um, yeah, so the next one in alphabetical order is Lee. Hi, um, my name's Lee. I'm also based in so-called Montreal. Um, I'll keep it short and sweet about me because you can read my piece in the book, which I feel like is a lot about me and part of my story, or at least part of my story as it relates to Jew Jewishness. Um, I'm very happy to like be a part of this project I was quite nervous about it, but with some gentle peer pressure from Cindy, uh, which I'm grateful for, I'm happy to have, yeah, to be a part of this project. Um, so my piece is kind of about inheritance and about grappling with inheriting things that are not what I would necessarily choose, but are kind of tied to me. So I think a lot of us as Jews can really relate to that and grappling with how to honor the past and the sacrifice and the loss that like came from um, being the descendant of genocide survivors, but also the beauty and survival that comes with that too. And also trying to create my own life in a world that looks totally different from even the generation before me. Um, and it's about reclamation of things that are worth holding on to and about living between worlds. And it's about place too, um, because my family moved to Montreal after the second world war. Um, and yeah, it's kind of about a reclamation of place and the changing meaning associated with place. And it's also kind of about femininity and um, the story of women in a family. So hi, mom, who's also on this call. Um, yeah, so you can read that if you have the book. Um, and I'll pass it on to Malka. 
Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Madeline Ramalka. Uh, it's really nice to be here. Um, I'm in Kingston, uh, which is in Ontario in Canada, and uh, occupied Indigenous land used by and home to like, different nations, um, mostly Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations, um, historically and in the present. Um, and uh, I, you know, the, the radio show, so I worked on the piece with Avi and the radio show that we worked on together is was something that we did in the past. Um, and it's also very connected to this place, uh, mostly in a negative way, <laughs> um, because Kingston is a, is a very white um, wasp, like culturally, culturally waspy place where, um, you know, you don't bump into a lot of Jewish anarchists on the street. <laughs> Ha, Montreal. <laughs> um, so, a few more. So, um, yeah, so we started the show, you know, for lots of different reasons, and, and we talk about it in the book, but I think one of the things that, you know, drove us to keep doing it was around community building, like Jewish anarchist community building amongst ourselves um, in terms of the creators of the show and also just making all of these connections. It was this really great excuse um, to reach out to like the neo klezmer artists that Aaron was talking about and the like ongoing generation of queer Jewish artists that are I think in my opinion like leading the way in terms of grappling with a lot of the questions um, that are addressed in this books and and have been doing that um, and so yeah so it was so that's that was a um, a way. It was like a way to do community building at that time, I think. Um, and um, yeah, and I, yeah, thanks everyone for being here, and thank you uh, to to Tamara and to Kay and to Noah and to everyone who's like helping to facilitate this. It's uh, it's just an honor to be part of it. Back to you, Cindy. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, I'm so wishing I was with you all. And I, we've a lot of us have spent a lot of time together in so-called Montreal, um, including doing various Jewish anarchist things. So it's so sad to be on Zoom, but so beautiful. <laughs> um, and I, for, I really also just wanted, before we move into sort of some questions, I wanted to just mention that I think there are about 40 or more voices, probably many more actually, 40 or more type stories or contributors to the anthology. Um, everything from poets to sort of magical fairy tales to um, things that will make you cry. I've had a lot of people say that, <laughs> but pieces um, to things that will make you see yourself in this sort of way. I really, a lot of people who wrote had that experience saying they felt like they were coming out and they were scared, um, which yeah, feels hard to me that we have to be, have had to be scared to be Jewish anarchists in, in public um, and be sort of, you know, feel good about who we are, you're right. Be, be able to be like, this is like a powerful and you know, a powerful part of who we are. So I just wanna really say there's like, there's pieces of art in it. There's all sorts of things. So I really wanna just express again, gratitude to you know, over 40 people who contributed to it. And there's many, 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 many other voices and people mentioned in all those um, 40 contributions. And um, many of them came by me just putting out a call and doing a lot of outreach. And obviously, you know, I hope that, through this, thousands more of us who are Jewish anarchists find each other. So that is one of the goals. Um, it is not exhaustive, it is a sampler and hopefully a beautiful one. And um, I really wanna thank everyone who contributed who's like not on the screen tonight either. So what we're gonna do for the rest of the time is I was gonna, we all of us together came up, we've been having really nice conversations leading up to this. I really like the process of putting this space together. It's been very collaborative and taken us a long time and lots of conversations, which is how everything that Jewish anarchists do do. do. <laughs> <laughs> and really beautiful, collaborative. And we came up with some questions. So I'm just gonna ask them and then we're gonna just do this kind of informal, hopefully just having a conversation about some of the questions. And when it, I'll, I'll just toss one out and when that seems like it's kind of waning, I'll throw out another one. So, so the first one is um, just kind of a general question about um, what excites, whoever wants to answer this, what excites you about this anthology coming into the world um, right now? Uh, what, what possibilities or openings do you see it sparking or do you hope it will? 
blessed revolution. <laughs> um, I, maybe I, I can, I don't mind saying a couple of things about that and then passing it off. But um, uh, we were joking because Tamara was actually interviewing Cindy and I for this. And then, then this happens and technology is sometimes not our friend, but uh, the, Tamara's computer ate the interview. So it just, we said words and then the words poof, disappeared. Um, so, but what I was saying in, in that interview and, and, uh, and I'll just say it here is um, when, when I first came into anarchism, uh, you know, and I think for a lot of us, when we come into the movement, you look for things that kind of resonate with you, obviously. And, and, and the fact that, you know, we have this tradition within Judaism and Jewish communities of anarchism, like Cindy said, going back to the beginning of anarchism is incredible. And, um, and I came across this documentary that maybe some people have seen. It's, it's simply called The Jewish Anarchists. And it's, it's a documentary that tells the story of the final days of the Yiddish anarchist newspaper, uh, Frei Arbiter Stein. Uh, that might be hard for the captioner, but the English translation is the Jewish voice of, or free voice of labor, rather, uh, free voice of labor. And um, it, it's a really, it, it's, it's a fascinating documentary because it's, excruciatingly boring in a lot of ways, but also excruciatingly beautiful. Uh, all of these interviews with Jewish anarchist elders. And, um, you know, living in Montreal, you realize that this is part of our own city's fabric too. And, and um, uh, I used to volunteer at, at the anarchist bookshop here in Montreal. And then I was really heartened to know that the first anarchist bookshop in Montreal was a Jewish anarchist bookshop opened by Hirsch Hirschman. And it sold cigars and, and anarchist literature, which is just so funny because you can't really picture that for anarchist info shops these days. Although maybe some sell cigars, I don't know. Um, and um, sorry, I'll just move things along here because I, I don't want to be stuck in the, the beginning of the 20th century. Um, but you, you realize like this is part of the fabric and the lineage of the city. Rose Pesoda, who is another Ukrainian Jewish anarchist also spent a lot of her life here organizing amongst uh, the you know, women and needle trade workers in the city. And, and there's this incredible body of work I think that exists of, of Jewish anarchism from that time period. But I think very little that examines what the present moment is. So like, what are the contemporary anarchist struggles, right? Like what are queer and trans anarchist Jews, anarchist Jews of color, you know, like what, what are we saying in this present moment um, when we have populism and fascism rearing their heads? And so that's what excites me is that I feel like it, it is speaking to a little bit of, um, or it's filling a hole rather, um, you know, in terms of this kind of gap in, in terms of the historical material out there. I can go and then Malcolm, I'll pass to you. Um, yeah, this question I was really excited to answer as well, because for me, this book is just so much excitement. I keep like smiling, um, just seeing people in the chat talking about this thing that I love so much. And I think um, it's just honestly overwhelming to, and I keep saying at these different events and different things, it just feels extremely surreal that this thing that felt like, oh my God, like everyone's, in the, a lot of people in the chat are saying, I thought I was the only person who was a Jewish anarchist or the amount of energy it has taken me to express these two parts of myself and express them together and express them in places where maybe they're not valued or not heard or not understood. Um, so just to have this moment of us being able to come together and, um, see ourselves reflected in a book or in speakers that are speaking or in chats that are happening um, feels surreal and feels beautiful. And I forgot to mention earlier that I have been organizing also with Rage, Rebellion, 
rebellious anarchist young Jews. And we were organizing this um, anarchist Jewish community on Facebook and different places uh, maybe three or four years ago. And we were just seeing this, we put out like one image that was like, I don't have it on my wall right now, like fight back against pipelines, two bishvat, like with um, someone sitting in a tree at a tree set. And this combination of Jewish texts and holidays and our anarchist struggles being presented together, um, the responses that we were getting were just enormous. People saying, I, I felt this way so long. I wanted these things to be together and I never saw, I never knew how this could happen. And starting back from then when it felt like we were putting stuff out there and we were like, we don't even know if anyone cares. We don't even know if anyone is gonna watch this, if anyone's gonna see it to then meeting um, Malka and Aaron at different things and Cindy and saying, wow, wait, you got you guys care too? And so just for me to go from this moment of just me and my sibling, Naomi, putting stuff on Facebook that we cared about to now there's a book and there's people talking about it. And I hope that we continue to organize as people are saying in the chat and we continue to meet each other. Um, it's just a gift. So that is what I'm excited about. And I'll pass on to Malka. Thanks. Thanks, Ami. Um, you know, I think that, I think Cindy, you talked a little bit about the, the vulnerability of people, you know, who wrote, you know, for like wrote for the book. Um, and, you know, I have like hesitated even, like I feel vulnerable reading the book, <laughs> you know, like, uh, cause so, you know, and, you know, I, I think to a certain extent, some of it is like, oh, I'm like worried about what I'm going to encounter there and how, um, how much I'll relate <laughs> and what that experience will be. And I've certainly, you know, felt that as I've been reading some of the essays. Um, and I think part, part of that is because a big part of the book is um, facing historical, historical and contemporary traumas. Um, and, um, you know, how, like, what to do with that. Um, and contemporary Jewish life, like 20th century Jewish life, second half of 20th century Jewish life, you know, has, there's been a lot of silence around trauma. I mean, this is not like a new comment that I'm making, right? <laughs> but I think that the um, moving past the silence uh, around like the, the trauma is, um, still something that is like really necessary and it's still like very much an ongoing project and also such an essential project to actually move in the direction of anything that's liberatory um, because like being stuck in trauma, especially when, you know, big parts of like Jewish people have access to power is like an extremely kind of dangerous place to be. <laughs> Um, so, um, I think that, you know, so I think that that's one of the things that I found, I, I'm finding really compelling about the book. Um, also, also, of course, like there's lots of articles that are, you know, related to that about responding to, you know, contemporary fascism, white supremacy as Jews. Um, and I think that that also, you know, the like, the, the contemporary American and global white supremacist movement definitely has, like I think is related to why there's this resurgence of Jewish anarchists, right? Because there's this urgency to um, connect um, and uh, talk. Um, so I think like those are like other sort of um, observations that are really important um, or like commentary that's really valuable. Um, and then, you know, related to that piece around trauma, I, I think also there's a lot in there about finding home. And I think you also mentioned that at the beginning, Cindy, and, you know, like as diasporic peoples, as anti-colonial, like from an anti-colonial perspective, and that's like a really hard concept for me, I think. Um, to think of like what home can potentially mean. Um, and then the last thing I, I was thinking about with regards to this question is that it's in the very first essay 
on his essay, like that, you know, um, the message is loud and clear. Anti-Semitism is one of the like primary dialectical tensions of European Christianity and not addressing that is like, you know, we do that at our own peril as people who want to like fight for liberation, right? So I think that that is also what excites me about this book is like, we need to, we need to put that message forward because yeah, because we need to do something about it for 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 all of us. So that's that's so that's what I'm excited about. There's lots there. I will tentatively be continuing to read it. <laughs> I don't know if anyone wanted to jump in. Yeah, I can ask something really fast. I think the thing that I mean, a lot of what other folks are saying is resonating with me. But I think the thing that's most exciting to me about this book in this moment now is that. It's a, it's a resource, it's a thing that tangibly exists that I don't automatically feel skeptical of. I think like as a person who, whatever, grapples with uh, very hierarchical institutions with a capital I and, you know, grapples with being told how to be in the world in the right way. Um, and I had a quite liberal Jewish education and upbringing, but I think, you know, coming into anarchism have has had this kind of healthy skepticism towards, um, yeah, rigid institutions and structures. And I think especially like the Jewish institution with a capital T is like quite, is quite alienating on like lots of levels. This the Zionism piece that there's like the strict gender norms piece, the, the very capitalist piece, especially in Eastern Canada. Um, so I think for me, I'm excited about something that even just in the title doesn't initially instigate this deep skepticism and like fear that I am once again going to be confronted with like deep alienation. Um, and reading the book, you know, I don't necessarily connect all of it and that's okay too, but it feels like my hyper, it feels like my people more so than when I walk into a synagogue or more so than when I um, encounter basically any other Jewish space. So. Yeah, I'll just say one more thing, if that's all right. Because, um, yeah, and beautiful what everybody, was, uh, what everybody has been saying, and Wilka, what you brought up made me think a lot about, um, I'm just really excited to be able to define anti-fascism for myself and to not have, and to define what my Jewishness means within that context of um, how I want to fight for myself. And I think that was like one of the things after um, the tree of life shooting here that I like went off, off on some people at this meeting because there was a bunch of Christian people who were sitting there were like, here's how we should do this or here's what can happen, like how we can protest or how we can resist. And I was like, no, let us resist with our practices. Let us resist like as who we are. And I think I've been shocked um, in the past like, since Trump has been elected and prior to the amount of times that fascism has been able to be separated from um, anti-Semitism and from its impact on Jews. And so I'm really excited in this moment to say we are people impacted by fascism and we have a response as a people impacted by fascism. And our response is historical and our response is um, what has kept us alive for so long. Um, and I really want um, Jewish people to feel confident uh, saying this is how we want to do this and if there's going to be a hundred ways that we say this is how we want to do this because they're not a monolithic we argue um, and I want people who aren't Jewish who are anti-fascist to hear that we have a way that we want to do this and to not just assume that um, fighting fascism looks like the way that people who aren't Jewish and who are white and Christian how they imagine it to be because it's so broad and it's so beautiful and um, and we have a way to do this and I want I want to be allowed to do it. And that's what this book feels like it's an opening for. Anyone, anyone else wanna throw anything else in about this? I appreciate it, it got me so, I don't know, I was, I was thinking a lot about when you were all, all everything everyone said really resonated with me. And, uh, and yeah, for me, I, I feel like I've, it's been so hard for me yeah, like anti-Semitism isn't the only form of, of, you know, racist violence or, you know, deadly genocidal violence. Um, but I just, it's 
it so pained me for so long that it never, it rarely gets seen, especially um, by my fellow comrades who are anarchists who aren't Jewish. And so I'm really hoping this book, like Ami and other people were saying, um, yeah, opens up space for people to see the pain that comes out of us. Like that's anti-Semitism goes back centuries and looks different at different moments, but it's always interwoven with other forms of, you know, Islamophobia or anti-Blackness or anti-women or, and when we understand its distinctiveness, but also its relationships to other forms of genocidal logics, I think we have a better chance at getting it freedom. And I also just think it's, you know, I don't know the, after the recent, you know, white supremacist shootings in Atlanta, I just felt that pain so much of, you know, people who were, you know, I mean, Asian is the shorthand, which I, you know, erases so much diversity within who under, felt that moment um, in the same way that when people say Jews, it erases all the diversity within Judaism. But for shorthand, I will say that pain of that moment where people are like, can't people see that we're at risk too? Can't people see that, you know, we're, we're part of the targets? I, it just, I just felt that such a deep sense of solidarity of grief and sorrow, and also such a deep sense of the beauty of how people grieved and resisted afterward in their own ways. And I was like, we all should, you know, until fascism is not here, <laughs> so we don't have to do that. We should all be able to do that. And we should all understand that our struggles are interconnected. And it shouldn't take white supremacists killing various different identities for, to remind us of that. So I hope this anthology creates more space for solidarity. You know, I just really, between and across all our imperiled and beautiful um, experiences, identities and histories. Um, Cause I, yeah, so really appreciate. But yeah, anyway, I just really right. appreciate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, okay, and I wanna move on to another question which kind of came out what we just talked about. Um, what different ones do you think, what is, I know if I've heard, um, um, Ami mentioned Naomi who um, is probably watching this right now and does a lot of um, uh, Jewish anarchist art and other has pieces in the book too. And I remember Naomi saying distinctly one time the pain of like, I, I, I never feel like, if I'm gonna misquote, Naomi, but like, you know, when I'm in Jewish spaces, um, I can't feel anarchist. And when I'm in anarchist spaces, I can't feel Jewish. And so I kind of want to get it. What do you, what do you think anarchism, what do we bring to anarchism as Jews? And what does anarchism bring to our Judaism or Jewishness? Like what's the relationship between those two things that we actually want them to feel like they're in the same space within us? What do we bring to anarchism as Jews or what does anarchism bring to our Jewishness or Judaism? I can, I can start off with this one. If Let's turn to that. Um, I mean, you know, I think you, again, you sort of said it at the beginning, Cindy, that, you know, anarchism does a lot, but it doesn't give us tools for like our life on a day to day basis. Um, so, you know, to me, um, and, and, and Avi was reminding me when we were talking earlier this week, also like Judaism anarchism, <laughs> you know, right? So I think it's like really useful to remember that. Um, and I think the way way he put it, uh, I hope you don't mind me saying, Evie, that like anarchism is also like, it's like the best of the options of like European political frameworks that we can kind of draw on. <laughs> you know, it's not everything, but it's a sort of like our best, it's our best option. So that's, I think that that is how I feel about anarchism. So. It gives us like tools for analysis. It gives us like a way to understand the world around us. And it also helps give us a vision for liberation, um, um, which I think is so important. And then kind of bringing that together with like Jewishness for me is like the, the cultural history and the making, the, the meaning making. So, you know, like Jewishness literally makes meaning of your bodily functions <laughs> from your bodily functions to um to like the oneness of the entire universe judaism has an explanation there's some weird explanations <laughs> right that i don't necessarily understand but i feel like that is just like so much richness that you know that like anarchism is this like straight line, you know, and Judaism brings makes it into like a full multi-dimensional life. Um, so, um, and then, you know, 
I think that both, you know, I think that interplaying for me, interplaying between the two is like grappling with ethics. Um, and, you know, like Jewishness that is not anarchist is like, there's so, there are, I would say there are probably more problems in Jewishness than in anarchism. Those are like lots of problems in anarchism too, but the problems in Jewishness sometimes, have sometimes felt insurmountable for me. And I, I'm sure that I'm like not alone as like a feminist saying that, right? <laughs> but um, but I think that like both traditions had this sort of trying to kind of find the ethical path and like how to think through that and how to look at history and how to study stories, you know, and we can really draw on those. Um, um, yeah, and then, and then the only other thing I was thinking about this question too is that um, one of the things that I think is really lacking in Jewishness and you know, one of the things that also I like don't know very much. Um, so I'm sure that there's lots, of, I know there's tons of people here who know lots of things and could teach me that I'm wrong about what I'm about to say. <laughs> but I think for me, you know, there's not Jewishness doesn't have a solid foundation of solidarity. I don't think solidarity is like a, a strong, see, even though he's got like, I think, <laughs> okay. um, but, um, but I think like, I think we can, there's all kinds of ways through it, but I think anarchism really helps us bring solidarity to, to Jewishness for me. Mm. I'll leave it there. I mean, do you want to, do you want to go next? Debbie? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, you just left that like big, tasty piece of brisket to like chew on. Uh, but uh, so I think maybe I'll just like leave it to the side for now, but uh, or not. Um, yeah, yeah. I, part of what Madeline was saying and, and what was making me think of that, I was listening to an interview uh, um, on a podcast called Muslims Do Things. Uh, it was an interview with uh, Sundus Abdul Hadi, a Muslim Iraqi um, person who lives in Montreal. And Sundus has this idea of like deeply rooted communities um, that like understand, this is from the interview, understand struggle, they and understand communities of care and experiences of empowerment and healing. And, um, and yeah, I mean, like, I think I, Judaism has so much to offer and is so deeply rooted that to help us, um, you know, and like, like, yeah, like Mako was saying, like anarchism is like pointing to these structures that are unjust, that pointing to the state, pointing to capitalism, pointing to, 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 um, higher, like, you know, um, like, uh, hierarchies of injustice and um and the sort of answers to those questions are really complex and ongoing and i think you know a lot of us have come into anarchism i think you know the i, I think it's the the version of anarchism that is kind of ahistorical on purpose i would say kind of from like it's much better now, but I kind of thought like crime think used to be like this, but like kind of like this, um, it's like a anarchist magazine and stuff, but like of like, you know, we like come from nowhere. We are, there is no history. We're just like the popping out these little superheroes. And, you know, I mean, I think like it's kind of like a bit obvious, like where people are coming from but un, in an unspoken way on that. But, but it, it's just, it, 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 it doesn't help us answer those questions that anarchism is putting out. What actually helps us is all of our different, you know, cultures that we come from. So not just Judaism. And we talk about that in the, in the article that when we were first starting doing the radio show, we were in conversation with Muslim anarchists who were doing this work too. And, and like, um, so, you know, I just wanted to like maybe mention like some of the ways, cause I was kind of Cindy's question that, I, it, for me and maybe for other people, uh, like notes spread out everywhere. But like one thing is, um, and Cindy alluded to it with the time that we started. Also, we're in Lagbomer now, Hugsamev. Um, 
that Judaism is always about figuring out what band like boundaries, like what boundaries are holy and what are profane. Or, or when does such and such time start and such and such time finish? And what do we do with the liminal spaces in between? Um, and so that's on its own helps us, you know, figure out what boundaries are unholy, borders, um, uh, you know, capitalism, the separating of ourselves, individualism, the, you know, racial capitalism, and then, but also like to help us like that part of the process of freedom is not just smashing those boundaries, but figuring out how to like make good boundaries, boundaries that are freeing. Um, um, so, you know, we, we sanctify Shabbos, um, this space and time um, to be like, and, and which is in and of itself, and people have talked about this a lot, I, I would recommend Abraham Joshua Heschel's book, The Sabbath, but also others, you know, talking about how this space and time that we make holy is explicitly this counter. It's it's not about being productive. It's it's it is a way grinding on the gears of capitalism in its own way of like, we're not doing this. And it's just a taste. I don't think any of us think, okay, we just need to make you know, it's, a, it's supposed to be a taste of the world to come. And so that's one example. Um, someone who's here, Nava, uh, and I sort of tried to put a mishmash class together about um, how to do like um, boundaries and like repair work. And so we talked about the Jewish Kabbalistic ideas of tzimtzum, of, of, the, uh, of a certain Jewish cosmology that uh, Kabbalistic cosmology that talks about the creation of the universe and, and God wanting to be in relationship with humans. And to do that, God had to withdraw from God's self and leaving this empty space in the middle. And I mean, all kinds of things happened after that, like the creation of the world and then brokenness in the world. But having said that, like, you know, there's, there's what to learn that this this experience of wanting to be in loving relationship involved making space and making a boundary. And so like, um, you know, again, things that we need to learn as, as anarchists, you know, um, that there's certainly tools in the like non-Jewish world that can help us do this. But, you know, we've, Judaism has been grappling with questions of tshuva, of repair, of when, when harm is done. And um, that again, it's like keeping us rooted in, in this. Um, I have two other notes maybe, but I, I wanna say like one other thing is like sometimes Judaism can help us like be like more radical when I think like the liberal kind of pressures on us make us forget like we have the Yovel, we have uh, the Jubilee like an idea that every seven years, like debts are just done. And like, of course, like everything it's debated and, and, and how, what it looks like. I can't remember if it's seven years or 49, maybe Noah, you can help me, but there's also like freeing all prisoners. Um, and it's like, just free them, just flip it. Like last becomes first, the first becomes last. Like, and obviously that's simplistic. And, and I don't want to like, but again, it's like, there are times where actually, I think we can look to Judaism. Well, there's lots of times where we can look, we look, we look, and it's like, oh, this is regressive. And then there's times where we're like, what are we thinking? Like, it's seven years, like, why? And we're doing private ownership. Like, anyways, this is just some thoughts. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll jump in for a second. Thanks for that, Avi. Um, I think kind of for me, what it all boils down to is when I was in, and maybe what Naomi was saying in that comment that they made, um, I was surprised when I started to become an anarchist how, um, like maybe six or seven years ago, how um, unrooted or how seemingly unrooted in culture so many anarchist communities were, but how that actually made so many anarchist communities rooted just in white Christianity. And of course, this is like, there's many multitudes of anarchists, anarchisms that aren't white and aren't Christian, 
but just the, a lot of general anarchisms when I was going around, um, it felt that way to me. And I felt like it was so strange to me because I felt like I had to make this choice of like, do I leave behind like myself and my people and my culture to become part of this bigger thing that feels like Malka was saying, like this bridge to build this world that I want and this like vision of this world that I want. And how is this liberation if, um, if I'm being asked to make that choice and or imp implicitly or quietly asked to make that choice. And it felt like, as Muslim was saying, just another, I was like freaking out because I was like, is this just another form of like assimilation that I'm going to undergo? Um, so I think what Jewish anarchism has done for me is to be able to like let myself challenge those spaces and say, hey, this cool aesthetic or this cool, like these cool texts that you're reading, you're like, yeah, crime think as Avi was saying, like, um, there's some pain here that it's inflicting on people who are outside of this, um, this paradigm or this way and who want to have a connection to their cultures and to their peoples. Um, and just to bring that to people and, and not like in a harsh way, because I know people have everyone, like a lot of white people, a lot of white Christians have also gone through processes of assimilation. That's why it's in things look that way. So to say, hey, like, can we heal this together? If I bring my songs, if I bring my prayers, if I bring my tradition, maybe it'll help you open up the parts of you that was lost as well. And then we can start to build from that place. And I think that is the point for me that has led to real meaningful solidarity or real understandings, like Milsey was saying, of other groups who are other peoples who are experiencing pain um, in the form of as a people um, and letting that become part of anarchism, I think is freeing. And I think, again, also building on the work of so many other anarchists from other like marginalized cultures who've been doing this work and have inspired me to do that too. Um, so yeah, I hope that we can, I hope that like in 10 years that it's not a question of like, can you bring your cultures and your ways and your people into anarchism and I hope um I hope that that's something that we're again building on as we do this work anyone else any thought, thoughts about that kind of general question about the relationship of anarchism and Judaism yeah I can chime in fast um often and then Aaron I see you looking keen so I'll pass to you after. Um, I think often when this question comes up, I, I mean, I have a lot to say on it, which I'll touch on in a second, but often I also feel this kind of tension because sometimes it feels like this search for this essential piece of Judaism that like inherently makes us anarchist. Um, and I think that there's a lot to learn from looking to, to history and the stories that come from that and and tradition for inspiration. And I think that is like a piece that's really important and beautiful. Um, but I, I don't see like an essential part of, of Jewishness that is anarchist. And I think some people in this chat might disagree, but that maybe is another example of like the ways in which we can bring disagreement as a crucial part of like the ways we build community. And Judaism has a has a very rich, thorough history of that. I think that, that maybe is essential to a lot of Judaism. Um, but I think the bridge for me is really about this, in anarchism, I learned to be skeptical towards the dominant structures. I learned to, to question the rules and why they were there and to have this sense of responsibility for a greater good. And then in Jewishness, I learned a willingness to have structures and rules, but with an inquisitive mind as to why they exist. Um, because Judaism has like a bajillion rules. And even if you're not necessarily inspired by the tradition of Judaism, like the religion, but you're more inspired by the history of being a part of Jewishness and Jewish people, um, there, there's lots of rules or like strategies of survival within that also that I think can feel a lot like rules or can for me sometimes. Um, so Judaism comes with the rules, but it is, it's highly encouraged to question them and think about them and debate them and, cr and create ones that work for our purposes. I mean, if you look at Halakha and you look at the, the rules around Judaism that have changed throughout, you know, 5,000 years of history, but the people are always finding ways to make it work for their realities. Um, and so that bridge is really interesting to me, the ways in which I'm I am keen to be critical of dominant structures and critical of rules because they're there, but also be 
encouraged to have rules and structure because we need that. Um, and even as an anarchist, like I think we we need we need boundaries and we need rules. And this, you know, the idea that anarchism is total ruleness, rulelessness and chaos is, I mean, an outdated sense um, and isn't going to get us anywhere. But the idea that we create our own rules that work for what we want and what we need and fit our purposes is something that I think I've I've learned much more so in Jewishness. And I often find myself in anarchist spaces being the one being the one like to encourage us to have structure. Um, and also, I think the bridge between material and spiritual is something that really resonates with me. Um, those who know me, I think, might be surprised to hear me say this, but I, I'm like quite a materialist. Like I. I trust what is there in front of me and I have a material analysis of the society. That's like my communist upbringing. Um, but that, that is not always enough. Sometimes we need hope. Sometimes we need um, a sense of, yeah, desire that can't be given to us solely from looking at what material conditions are. And Jewishness can encourage a kind of spiritual opening into communities and spaces and organizing um, that needs more than just looking only at the tangible. Um, yeah, so those are my thoughts on that question. And I'll pass it on to Aaron. Oh, um, no, I'll, I'll, oh, I'll just maybe pass and I would love to keep moving on with the discussion. Okay. Um, I know we're, uh, we're almost at 830, which and we were going to somehow, maybe we'll keep going. We have a few and but uh, maybe I'll skip ahead to a, another question just to kind of um, we can see how we're feeling, go for another, see how we feel in, for another question or two, and then we'll um, stay here a little bit longer. Um, I wanted to skip ahead to sort of um, really kind of a larger question about like, what is it, so let's assume that we're Jewish anarchists. <laughs> um, what does it mean or look like to create cultural forms as Jewish anarchists, like art, songs, performances, um, or rituals and do it ourselves spaces? or how we might organize um, um, collectives or direct actions or within social movements as Jewish anarchists. I mean, there's a lot of examples in the anthology. There, I was, there are so many more that didn't get into the anthology. Um, everything again from direct action to uh, there's a piece about anarchists in black block who are Jewish anarchists and um, what that means to bring um, banners with a clearly, uh, yeah. Jewish banners that are in other languages that we can understand, but fascists can't, like as a, as a kind of black block technique, for instance, or using ritual practices um, as part of our direct actions um, to, to block streets while we're doing morning, um, morning rituals, let's say. And a lot of the anthology has incredible amounts of sort of cultural, forms of cultural production as Jewish anarchists, um, um, both as, as sort of anti-fascist work, anti-colonial, anti anti-capitalist, anti, uh, Christian supremacy, pa anti-patriarchy, all the other good antis, and um, but also forms of like opening up this kind of beautiful spaces of the world to the sort of the world to come that we want to glimpse. So yeah, and there's a real big emphasis in the anthology on um, rituals as rebellious, healing, um, generative, um, um, communal create creations of space outside of states and, and capitalist time. So yeah, so maybe so. I don't know, I'd just love to hear different examples or things that inspired you or things you want to do as Jewish anarchists to create rituals, space or cultural forms or, yeah. I mean, there's, it's, there's such a rich tradition of that. I don't even know. Yeah. I, I guess the other thing I want to point out within the anthology, which hasn't come in as much here, but there's a couple really incredible pieces about looking at um, um, people producing a Purim plays through like a, a very queer, sensual, anti-fascist lens, um, people doing a, a trans and queer drag performance as Jewish anarchists um, that also bring in, you know, both like how we understand, uh, that piece is actually really powerful and thinking about like how, how even um, our trauma as Jews um, has played into how we understand our bodies and, and sexuality and, and gender. So yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of beautiful examples in the anthology and maybe you, got, you all can just touch on some of your own thoughts on that. Rosa, can you come here? <laughs> we'll do a whole nother. We have to do I mean, a whole nother one I mean, just on cultural. <laughs> you just have to say, like, there's an article in the book by Rosa Daniel Lang yeah. called Spilling Out Juice and Brightness. And it's a, a very in-depth look at this very question. And um and 
and there's a lot of wisdom there and a lot of examples over time of what um of you know effective jewish cultural work which rosa is um emphatic that cultural work is organizing work um and and you know things problem problematics and you know successes failures i don't know i i i don't really want to try to summarize this like really well thought out article but um you know i uh it, there, there's it's really generous um well not, not, not just generous really helpful um a lot to chew on there too um i don't think i, I don't know I, I don't have too much more to say except like um yeah a lot of important questions are brought up and addressed so I, i'll just see if anyone else has, wants to jump in well yeah if if i could say i mean um I, I really loved Ami's piece in this um, because Ami, like you said something in there, like like Jewish ritual is like, can't really like paraphrase. I'm sure you could just say it, but it's like a like a, a guidebook or something, or it's like a, essentially like a manual to help like heal from trauma. Um, and and I, I, I really love that idea because it's, uh, you know, again, it's, it's it's knowing that we can like rely on a lot of longstanding traditions, um, not only for like spaces of comfort, but also, you know, this kind of springboard to um, to build action. And, you, you know, I, I wanna just kind of go back to a Cindy, uh, sorry, a story that Cindy alluded to in the beginning of this incredible anarchist um, Shabbat dinner that we had in Montreal a few years ago, uh, down by the Lachine Canal in the Southwest, which is a historic working class community that's being gentrified. And it, it was so beautiful sitting there because we it was a potluck and people were sharing food. It's pre-COVID, so you could share food. And um, and and I remember just just you know a few yards away from us there was this incredibly bougie gentrified, like one of the, those restaurants on a boat with all these rich people enjoying their fancy dinners. And, and then there was um, a, a crew from Pittsburgh who had come down, uh, who started singing these beautiful radical songs. And, and I just loved that juxtaposition. Like it felt like we were taking this space back. Um, and, and, and I find that too, like when we do radical ritual in public, it, it always like instigates like people walking by and, and there's some like raised eyebrows and like a mixture of either appreciation or confusion. But to me, I just, I just love the fact that we're, we're taking back this space. Um, and then the last thing I'll say really quickly is um, one of the stories that, that inspired me to write the piece that I wrote about music was uh, this incredible action that happened uh, a few summers ago, just north of Montreal, about an hour north of the city, where um, there's a company that's based up there called Tisseur, which got a contract to build a migrant detention center in Montreal, a new migrant detention center. And so there was a few activists from Montreal, just like a few carfuls that drove out to do a protest. And it normally would have been like a, like a small protest on a side road in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of a country. But it just so happened that it coincided with Klez Canada and this, this uh, gathering of, of klezmer musicians and Yiddish enthusiasts, which was happening a few towns over. And, you know, shout out to Simone, who's here, who was at Klez Canada. And I know like Avi, and I'm sure many other people have been there too, who who really made Klez Canada like a really radical space and organized to bring huge carfuls of, uh, of klezmers, of klezmer musicians down to this demonstration to lend their support. And they all came with, with their instruments in tow. And, and it just, it brought this incredible energy because again, they were singing these songs that we've been singing for hundreds of years. And it's like, we are singing them now in solidarity with you know people coming to these lands from, from all over the world to say, you know, fuck borders, fuck migrant detention. Um, and 
it was special. And maybe one thing, does anyone else want to add anything? Yeah, maybe just one thing that's coming to me as we're having this conversation is just this idea that, um, like, <laughs> just emotional, um, that, like, we're still alive as a people, like, that just kind of, like, came through to me, um, just that realization that I think when we're asking the question of, like, how do we build culture from our own peoplehood and, or peoplehood, but our own, like, culture and peoples and histories, it's like, we're still a people who can build culture, like people build culture. That's what people who are alive do. And so I think a big part for me of um, figuring out like, how do we build this culture that's radical and life-giving from our Jewishness is letting myself remember that um, I'm still alive and that like Jewish people are still alive and we're still here. And I think what someone mentioned about like the silence around um, our traumas, I think a lot of what that does too is it makes it seem like it's all in the past. And even though I was raised in like a vibrant Jewish world, a vibrant Jewish culture, um, but it still just felt like um, the ways of my ancestors were in the past and they could help them back then, but they were there and then everyone died. <laughs> and now we're here in this weird place where we're just like trying to be like everyone else so that we can survive it, you know? So um, just bringing, um, bringing attention to the things that we've gone through and then letting ourselves know that like the really, really difficult things are over and that now we're alive and we, we're still a people here and we can still be creating together. And I'm just excited to, um, to see like where we go knowing and that's why I think like Aaron the stuff that you've brought like with the contemporary like Yiddish music it really inspires me in that way because I'm like wow people are still we're still doing this like we're still innovating we're still creating um and Lee in your piece as well when you're talking about the the shows in the backyard you know that's like this combination of like this past and the present um still speaking to each other like yes like of course because we're still alive like we're still here and um and yeah, I just want to remember that and to continue to build um, our culture from like the dignity that we can give ourselves as a people who are still here and alive and who have a lot to give to the world and to each other. And it, yeah, thanks. I mean, um, one of the things that we did in the backyard show was. Um... You want to explain that maybe Lee or oh. other shows? I, I, I mean, there, there are shows, people were at Close Canada and then and then after they're still around. And so we, we did shows in the backyard of the, the riot house there in Montreal and um, with Rivola, with uh, um, Stephanie and Miley, with uh, folks at Close Mormon in Montreal. And um, one of the years we did a fundraiser for the Mohawk Language School as part of it um, in Ganawage, I believe. They were looking for some funds. And that's something I'd like to sort of develop more is long-term is trying to, you know, um, obviously it's not a binary. There are definitely like a lot of indigenous Jews out there and just not, I mean, out there, like not in this room, but like, and, but just generally like thinking about, you know, creating diasporic culture on stolen land which I know a lot of people are thinking about in this book and, and elsewhere. Um, but yeah, it was sort of important to us at the time to be like, we're trying to reclaim and grab, get back this language that was taken from us from genocide, assimilation, Zionism. You know, for me, it's been um, three generations since Yiddish was spoken, uh, um, uh, like, regularly my family and yeah and and so like as that as that work how do we tie that work to um the kind of cultural resistance and organizing that's happening um that's like decolonial with a specific reference to right here um 
And um, yeah, I think one of the things that Rosa talks about in the article is kind of like the experience of starting to dig and realizing there's like an ice iceberg, okay, land and sea metaphors didn't work, but, um, and, um, you know, and I know that I had that experience and I'm still having that experience where like, because so much of our Jewish educations were so shit or were cut off because of patriarchy or, or class um, exclusion and whatnot, um, and just like we were just taught about the Mossad and, you know, and Zionism and not about Judaism and Jewish history and cultures, um, that it can be pretty overwhelming, but it's also like important to keep digging. It's important to look at the context that um, what we're digging come out of and how they're received and and also like how they're shared. I mean, I think that's like something too as, as like anarchists we can really bring to that work. Cause I think like, or we can look at what anarchists have done in terms of like pedagogy and, you know, like um, I, I think, you know we talked about this in our article a little bit that we did the radio show not from like a place where we like were like authoritative Jews but we were just like trying to like start discussions and start digging but yeah it's kind of it is an exciting moment because I think that we're figuring out ways to share knowledge in a, in like more than ever amongst Jewish anarchists and radicals Jewish radicals broadly I mean I'm thinking of like like what's going on with Sfara you know queer Talmud you know with um uh you know our, our friend um I have a few friends who are learning Ladino and then like teaching it amongst each other and teaching it to other um, other friends who are learning like, yeah, like, um, yeah, obviously what we've talked about in terms of like, look constantly like learning Yiddish song, like, you know, Ami, I just found out you were in rabbinical school, like that's so cool. And, you know, it's just figuring out these ways to transmit and share ethically uh, the, these cultural forms and knowledge and then we can actually play with them better you know it's more empowering and it's like it's not to say it's bad to just like slap a slogan on a banner but like it's going to be more effective in in what we're doing um so yeah those are just like I said I wasn't gonna try to paraphrase Rose's article and I just did so please um yeah, and Chuldik Mir. Can I, I, I'm just gonna add something really short, if that's okay, um, which is just that I, in terms of the question around like, what do we see in terms of cultural production? I mostly feel a great amount of gratitude to all the like radical Jewish cultural producers out there. <laughs> and, you know, I was able to go to two Purim spiels that were both online this year. Um, one of them was the IJV Purim Spiel, um, and another one out of a shul in Seattle, Kadima, you know, and, uh, and, you know, through our show, we just spoke to so many, um, amazing artists and filmmakers and musicians, um, pretty, like, literally every one of them are, were gay. <laughs> it's like all queer artists that are doing this work, it seems, which is great. Um, and I, I think that, yeah, I just think that, like, I just have so much gratitude. I, you know, it's like making space. I love what you said, Ami, about sort of the life givingness of culture and that like culture is what living people do. Um, that's really beautiful. I mean, <laughs> and, and, and so like, thank you for like helping me have life, <laughs> basically. So I know we're, we're kind of heading toward um, closing down the time of stepping outside of the time of, of all the things we don't like in this world. And uh, I wonder if anyone has, if anyone wants like a final, a final thought. I know there's so much, there's like three or four questions we didn't even get to and so much we could talk about and, um, yeah, I'm really struck by the pain of not being able. This is, I think, part of 
a question we didn't get to tonight, but maybe people could think about it, what we can draw from our Judaism and Jewish history and Jewishness as, as anarchists that are sort of playbooks for getting us through hard moments like this where we're separated from each other or um, you know how they've allowed us to th thrive too. So uh, I really wanna more just kind of to wrap this up, I really also just wanna really honor and shout out all the incredible Jewish anarchist projects that are going on right now that are about trying to draw on that sort of playbook of survival and th thriving um, from you know, producing our own calendars um, to making our own um, um, ritual objects from candles and things that aren't produced in, in Israel um, um, to creating spaces of joy and dance and theater, um, music, to engaging in um, direct actions and, and resistance um, as Jewish anarchists and rebels. And there's just incredible, um, incredible flowering of that culture. And I, I also really loved what Ami talked about. It's, it's, it's in the name of life. Everything's in the name of life. It's really beautiful. And, um, and solidarity too, I think too. So, um, but I wonder if anyone wants to, um, you know, say one or one or a little final thought, otherwise we're gonna move to Malka is going to do a, um, the Omar for today and might just briefly explain what the Omar count is. Um, we are in the 33 third night of a 49 day count. Um, and today, today each day brings together um, different values and you try to grapple with what that means each day for 49 days. And today is humility within humility. And I really feel that in gathering with all of you. There's so much like beauty and resilience and, and love and life in this space and in everyone who's here with us who I love. I know there's so many people in this, in this um, space tonight who I love. And um, yeah, how do we have humility with each other and humility that we're we're still alive, we're still struck surviving and we're gonna, you know, continue to be there in the future. So yeah, any quick thoughts? And then we will go to Malka. So one quick thought, um, yeah, I like to talk, so I'm talking a lot. <laughs> um, one quick thought, um, I was talking about this with Milstein a few months ago and I think um, I'm just very like, Okay, so this feels like the next thing that I want to start like thinking about and like working on a lot um, is I think that like as Jewish people, we need to be building a sense of like what liberation means for us um, in the places that we are in the global sense of things. Because I think there's, um, I wish we had more time to, to maybe talk about this sort of thing. I think there's something that happens when we see like other people experiencing, like other marginalized, racialized people experiencing different types of traumas and we're like oh yeah us too like we, we're we like we're, we're you we're you we're like you we're like you um and I think sometimes that can lead to like like bulldozing over other people's uniqueness and the intense work that like black liberation movements and indigenous liberation movements have put in to building liberation movements for themselves and so I think there's like this weirdness for like like white passing Jews or for Jews who are like um, part of whiteness in some capacity to um, to try and figure out like how do we fit into this broader picture of like liberation movements and how do we liberate ourselves from the pain and the traumas that we're experiencing too and I think I just really would love to have more conversations about like how do we build um, liberation f movements like for ourselves and not take other people's liberation movements and I think that's what's exciting to me about like what does Jewish anarchism mean for the future is being able to um, to ask those questions together and build a movement that speaks from us um, so we can be in solidarity and we can fight for ourselves among, alongside others and not, yeah, more on that later. But yeah, thanks for being on this panel, everybody. Anyone else want to name something that they hope we continue to talk about? They feel like this is just a beginning, not a, not opening, opening up space. Well, I know, I, Aaron, do you want to go? Sure, I mean, I think one thing that I, I try to hold and, and learn from, from this book is that, um, you know, the idea of Jewish anarchism is, is so vast and expansive too. Like my own personal understanding of it is secular and there's other people's that is deeply, deeply religious. And I think that's beautiful that it can 
hold both of those things. Like I'm, I'm learning a lot about what to bring to my own political practices through ritual, even though I wasn't brought up uh, in a religious way. And, and I just love this idea that, um, you know, for so long it was like dogmatic within anarchism to say no gods, no masters. And of course, like that, that has its own important history uh, that shouldn't be overlooked. But anarchism to continue to be relevant, it has to respond to where people are at and, and the times. And so I think I love this idea now that people are coming to uh, anarchism and saying many gods, no masters, <laughs> and, and it's opening up a, a really special conversation. Yeah. Anyone else wanna throw anything quick in? Otherwise, we can wrap, we can. And I just wanted to say sorry too, Cindy, to just, uh, before we wrap, we'll, we'll yeah. we just need to turn it back to Tamara too. Right, I thank you, yeah. Well, again, I, maybe I'll just wanna say, I, I'm really grateful to everyone who came tonight and participated tonight. And I hope we can create more and more and more spaces to have like increasingly in-depth conversations and wrestle with hard questions. It's just what we're good at doing about what Jewish anarchism looks like and how that relates to other parts of anarchism. And are the parts of Judaism? They're all like, um, like a, opening up lots of um, beautiful space in in the name of what I hope is mending the world, which is what the subtitle of the book is. And I take that task really seriously. This book isn't a book to sit on a shelf. Um, it isn't meant as a commodity. It isn't meant as an as object. It's meant as a as a provocation and inspiration for us to continue to mend the world in all sorts of increasingly beautiful ways. So, I just want to thank everyone for for being here um, and um, and you know uh, just uh, yeah. I mean, it would be fun to have this conversation if it was just us, but you know, hopefully, it will reverberate and come back and 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 um, and I know obviously people have been contributing in the chat, which is awesome, um, but. Uh, yeah, so so thank you and and thank you Noah for doing um yep. the uh, yeah. explanations in the chat. Um yeah, take care everyone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and if anyone has further questions after this, um any of us Jewish anarchists love talking and sharing and connecting. So just reach out to any of us. You believe me, you will get more than you ask for. <laughs> very very generous about sharing education and wisdom and if you if you want to meet other Jewish anarchists, contact any of us. <laughs> um, so Tamara, and then we'll go. I yeah, I will do a very very quick wrap up. Um, huge thanks to all the panelists for the emotional generosity, the honesty, the openness with which everybody shared. And you know, thank thank you to Kai for closed captioning. Thank you to Noah for defining all of the terms and concepts. Thank you for everybody who came out. I was following the chat as much as I could until it went scramble vision on my computer. And it was almost like being at several great events, great conversations. Uh, check out IGV, tune into the rest of our work, tune into more events um, like these ones, support us if you can. Uh, if this event didn't inspire you to buy this gorgeous, book and have it in your life uh, as a thing to work through and to get inspired nothing will there is art in the middle as well like gorgeous gorgeous inspirational art um and yeah aaron put those links up in the chat earlier today i would do it now but like i said scramble vision uh yeah please please purchase it it's wonderful um and yeah thanks so much without further ado I shall turn it over to Malka to, to lead us out in the closing ritual. Thank you. Um, Chag Sameach, everyone. It's Lagba uh, Omer. And we're just going to do the, the blessing and the counting of the Omer super quickly. Um, the Omer is the period between Pesach and Shavuos. Um, and we count each day, one through 49. Um, and Milstein was referring to um, 
a practice of understanding each day as a permutation of the emanations of Hashem. <laughs> That's my understanding. Um, and um, there are like traditions of looking at that, you know, each of those permutations and looking at different biblical characters. Um, and, you know, there's all kinds of different ways of thinking of um, those permutations. So, um, yeah, and one of the, the one of the other things about the Omer that I was thinking about um, this week, and well, I read something about is that it's also about you know from Passover, which is the story of Exodus, um, and accounting after that, and it's like one of the ways it can be understood is as a time to prepare ourselves for for freedom. So you know the like day that enslavement ends is not the day that freedom comes and that there's like a process to become free. Um, you know, and I was thinking about the contemporary abolitionist movement that, you know, understands abolition as the like contempt, the ongoing um, struggle against um, um, plantation slavery, transatlantic slavery and all of that. Um, and then from an anarchist perspective, how we talk about you know, the uh, breaking down of our um, patriarchal heteronormative capitalist socialization, that there's like a process. We don't just like decide we're against it and be free of it right away. Uh, so, so that's another way of thinking also about the, the counting of the Omer. So I'll start with a, a blessing um, and then do the counting. Um, and this is a, um, like non-gendered uh, God language version of the blessing that I found, which is lovely. Bruche ata, bruche ate Adonai, Eloheinu chai haulamim, asher kichanu de mitzvot te, vetsivanu al sefirat haomer. Blessed are you, eternal, life of all worlds, who has made us holy with their commandments and commanded us to count the Omer. Today is 33 days, which is four days, four weeks and five days of the Omer. And go make bonfires from burn cup cutters. I mean, shoot, <laughs> don't do that. Ah, edit, zoom. Ah. Good night, Bye. everyone. <laughs> Maya. Maya.